All right, tonight we're going to be looking uh, at, a, at a familiar story. I don't know, for those of you who have been in the faith for a long time, you're probably very familiar with the encounter of uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. But sometimes we forget, uh, you know, because not everyone's been in the faith that long, and, and sometimes these Old Testament stories not everyone is so familiar with. So we're just going to, this is going to be more of a Bible study sermon today. I'm pretty much going to be preaching through 1 Kings 18 and looking at that story, giving a bit of background so that you can get familiar uh, with one of these famous stories, this famous encounter that Elijah has on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal during the reign of King Ahab, who was the king of Israel at the time after the kingdom had split, obviously. So he was reigning over the, the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, not the southern kingdom of Judah, after it split, if you remember, Jeroboam's son, <coughs> sorry, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, split with Jeroboam. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So hopefully it's an interesting uh, recap of the story for you and uh, you're more familiar with these stories. And also, I think as well, as, you, as, as we look at these stories in depth and you hear from somebody who knows the story a bit uh, more in depth, that, that it gives you a bit of encouragement to go and read those stories. Go back and read the Old Testament. You realize there's a lot of information in these stories, a lot you can learn from them. And if you're not familiar with your Bible, you haven't really read it that much, you may not be so familiar with these stories where you're really seeing this detail in the story uh, unless you get more familiar with it. So to give you a bit of background to this, uh, this encounter in 1 Kings 18, we need to go to 1 Kings 16. And this is where we learn about King Ahab. So King Ahab, we start reading about in 1 Kings 16. So we'll just go through a couple of verses here just so we can see the backdrop of, of why this encounter even happened and why Elijah really challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and, and the context and the events that are happening at this time. So in 1 Kings 16, we see here the beginning of the reign of Ahab, the son of Omri. And in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. So I've always heard it said that, you know, when you had the kingdom split, so if you remember you had Saul and then Saul lost the kingdom to David, then David had Solomon and then Solomon had his sons, right? It was Reboam and Reboam didn't listen to the old men if you remember. So the kingdom was split between Judah and then the other, um, other tribes of Israel. So what happened is Rehoboam continued to rule the line of Judah, the tribe of Judah, and that's the line that Jesus came from. And then Israel was ruled um, by Jeroboam from then on. And then you have all the evil kings. And then you had some evil and some good kings as you go down throughout history. And that's how how it sort of split. So when, after that split, when you see the king of Israel, it's, it's talking about that northern kingdom of those, the, the majority of the tribes. And then you see the king of Judah, that's the, the, the one tribe that stayed under the line of David, uh, Solomon, Rehoboam. So uh, this is in the eighth year of Asa, king of Judah. So Asa is the king of the, the southern kingdom, right? And Ahab now is starting to reign over Israel, which is the rest of those tribes, that northern kingdom. Uh, and Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. So um, the reason why I was mentioning that is it's because it's that northern kingdom that has all the evil kings. But the southern kingdom of Judah has some good ones and some bad ones, right? Like think, think about Hezekiah was a good one, you know, Josiah. You know, a lot of people that hate the homos, right? They talk about Josiah because he break down all the sodomites' houses and everything. <laughs> right? That one's for you. Uh, let's go on to verse 31. First Kings 16. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing. So why is... See, King Ahab, it's interesting because there's a lot of chapters on King Ahab. There's a lot of different stories that involve King Ahab. But why was he such an evil king? It says, it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, 
king of the Zidonians and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So there's two things that made him this evil king. So not only did he walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So you remember Jeroboam, he was the one after, with Rehoboam when Israel, right? So there's the two kings now, it's Jeroboam. So what, what makes Jeroboam so evil? If you remember, uh, if, you, if you're reading through the Bible, you always hear that, oh, he walked in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Well, we learn about that, the sins of Jeroboam, in 1 Kings 12, right? So we go back in, in history to where Jeroboam took the, the other uh, kingdom of Israel and Rehoboam took the kingdom of Judah. So this is what Jeroboam did. Jeroboam said in his heart, so this is after he's appointed king. If you, if you don't know the story, he's basically appointed king over Israel. And Jeroboam, because Je uh, Rehoboam, because he doesn't want Jeroboam, obviously, to take over the majority of the kingdom, he actually goes to try and war against Jeroboam. And then God comes to, to Rehoboam and says, no, you're not going to fight against your brethren. And then they turn, right? So then, th then we get here to this story where Jeroboam is now thinking, well, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. So why? Because the temple that Solomon built was at Jerusalem, right? And because Judah's reigning in Jerusalem's the, the capital city of Judah, he's saying, oh, if my people in the kingdom of Israel are going to go up and worship in Jerusalem, their heart's going to turn back to Rehoboam's you know, kingdom and not mine. So what is he going to do? Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So what does he do? Whereupon the king took counsel, look at this, and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now how silly is this? <laughs> you just think, I don't know how people are so easily deceived, but people do, people worship like, you think about it, people worship statues of elephants, you know, Chinese people, they put their three gods with these statues and they pray to them and give them oranges. You think, how are people so stupid to, to make two golden calves and then say, these are your gods and these are the people, this is the gods that actually brought you out of Egypt. There are people that actually do that. It's completely silly. So two, he, he builds these two calves and he says, these, so he's basically saying, hey, it, it's too much trouble for you guys to go worship in Jerusalem. So he makes them two golden calves, right? And says, hey, these are your gods. O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people to, went, uh, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So I, I lined up, I underlined this thing became a sin. I just thought it was interesting that it, it says this thing became a sin. Why? Because the people went to worship these golden calves. Because uh, and this is just a point of uh, interest because I, I don't think it's actually a sin to actually just make statues of animals. Because some people think the sin of idolatry is when you make, when you actually make the molten image, right? But that's not the sin. The sin is when you make it and then you worship that golden image, right? You worship the image that you make. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it can't, it can't be a sin to make a molten image of something. Because you remember uh, God told Moses to make the molten image brazen serpent you remember and raise it up on a stick right and everyone looked at it they, that was actually a picture of jesus christ taking on the sin of the world so if it was a sin to make a statue of something in heaven and it just just the making of it is a sin then god couldn't command moses to make a brazen serpent he also wouldn't bless the temple right the temple had cherub remember he told them to make the, the ark of the covenant and put the golden cherubim right so it's 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 when they if they worship the cherubim on the on the ark of the covenant that's the sin and that's what they started doing with that brazen serpent if you know the bible they actually started worshiping that brazen serpent and that was the sin so he made these golden calves making of them was not the sin in of itself but it became a sin for the people because they actually started worshiping i mean he built them for them to worship obviously so that's how he caused them to sin because they did actually start worshiping them so this is the sin of jeroboam the son of nebat now, it's interesting because this is not the first time, obviously, that somebody's made a golden calf, right? <laughs> and told them to worship them and said the exact same words. Because if you go to Exodus 32, Aaron in Exodus did the same thing. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down 
out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto the people, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So there's, an interest, there's a few things here. Because, I mean, you know when you, when you see, um, you know when they portray this, uh, this making of the molten calf in, in the Ten Commandments, it's like this huge golden calf. I think, I think they forget how heavy gold is, right? You know, like they, 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 in the reserve banks, they, they have like, you know, like a, a pile of gold that's literally like this big. And, and, you know, they move that. They have to move that on like crates and like these anchored things because the gold is bloody heavy. You know what I mean? So that's why when he says he fashioned it with a graving tool at the hand, you know, I'm guessing he's making probably like a little golden calf because even a golden calf that's like this big would be really really heavy. I don't know if you guys have ever felt like an ounce of gold. It's like a small coin and you feel it, you're like, wow, this is really heavy. If you go to the Perth Mint, if you ever go to WA and go to the Perth Mint, you can actually pick up, I think it's like a hundred gram bar of gold, like this big block of gold and you can actually pick it up and it's so heavy, you almost like have to pick it up with two hands. So, you know, if it's a really big, I don't think, you know, just like four people, you know, in their, in their depiction of the golden calf, it's going to be able to like, just carry it like that. So it's probably this small thing. But the funny thing is, like, you make one calf, and he says, these be thy gods? I mean, I don't know, you're already stupid enough to worship a golden calf that you just made out of earrings. And now you think it's multiple gods, which, and which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it's just, they just come out. They just cross the Red Sea, right? They're at, they're at uh, Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. And it's just like, how can they be so silly to think that this cow that they just made was the one that brought them up out of the land of Egypt? So it's almost like Jeroboam has to like up the ante, right? He can't do what Aaron already did once. Now he makes two calves, right? So it's not one calf that did it, it's two calves, but people still believe it. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. <laughs> And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So if you know in the New Testament, that rising up to play is not just mucking around, they're actually fornicating with one another too. So what was the other sin of Ahab? So you remember it was that he walked in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. The other was Jezebel, obviously. Jezebel is like the epitome of a wicked woman uh, here in 1 Kings 16, 31. And you know a bit about what she did in the Old Testament and in, in Revelation as well, we read about a lady, Jezebel, and I don't know 100% sure, I, I guess people have different opinions on whether this is just, obviously it's not the Jezebel from 1 Kings 18, but is this like a woman that has the same spirit of Jezebel? Or was it a woman that was so wicked that she was, you know, maybe had wicked parents too that named her Jezebel? And then she got into a church there and was, uh, was ca causing havoc. But we see in Revelation 2, Jezebel uh, is obviously a wicked person. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? So this is the church here in Thyatira that she is operating in. These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, that reminds me of like, you know, women who, who are pastoring church, they call themselves a pastor. They call themselves a bishop, right? Whereas a bishop should just be a man. So it's saying here, like this woman, Jezebel, she's calling herself a prophetess because she's not one. To teach, so that's one thing she's doing wrong. She's teaching in the congregation of the Lord as a woman. And to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So I'll just underline fornication here, because I think it's interesting that in Revelation 2, uh, I think this is a passage that proves that adultery is actually included in fornication. Why? Because it says here he's, she's committing fornication with the servants. She gave her space to repent of her fornication. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, 
Look at this, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So you remember, gave, he, she was committing fornication with his servants, um, gave her space to repent of her fornication, and then he says, them that commit adultery with her into great tib tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, which is the adultery, which is the fornication. So I believe adultery is a subset of fornication, and fornication includes sex outside of marriage, which is with unmarried, married people, or even animals, right? Includes, is included in fornication. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give every one of you according to your works. So that's the backdrop. Uh, if you remember that uh, he, uh, <clears throat> King Ahab is the time that Elijah comes. So he not only is walking in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, so he's worshipping those golden calves and getting Israel to worship the golden calves, but he also marries this ungodly woman from a foreign nation, Jezebel, and this woman that he marries actually causes Israel to worship Baal, right, which is Satan himself, and worshipped him. So this is the, the spiritual you know, climate that Elijah comes on the scene in 1 Kings 17. And Elijah the Tishbite, so Elijah is sent by God here, and it says, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So this is when Elijah comes on the scene and he says to King Ahab, but, you know, there's going to be no rain until I say so. That's basically what he says. So I won't go through 1 Kings 17, but basically Elijah then goes and stays with this lady during this, fam so this famine is happening. But I want to get to 1 Kings 18 because this is where this is encounter is. Uh, with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. So we'll start in verse 1. So that's what's happening so far. So there's got, got this evil king, King Ahab, they're worshipping the cars, they're worshipping Baal. Then Elijah comes and says, there's not going to be any rain until I say. So if it comes in 1 Kings 18, it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year. So you think three years later, right, there hasn't been any rain. He says, go show thyself unto Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. So now, you know, there's been this basically curse on the land. Elijah has is, is, is basically gone into hiding three years. You know, nobody really knows where Elijah is. God comes to Elijah and says, hey, go and show yourself to Ahab. And I believe he gave him other instructions as well that we don't know here, but we know later on um, to, to do. But he's going to show himself to Ahab now because Ahab's actually been looking for him. He's going to show himself to Ahab and then God says, and then I'm going to send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab and there was a sore famine in Samaria. So why? Because there's not been any rain for the last three years and there's a sore famine in Samaria. Samaria is the capital city of the kingdom of Israel, right? Jerusalem was the capital city of Judah. Uh, and that's why uh, in the New Testament, when you hear about the Samaritans, that's why they're called the Samaritans, right? because the capital city of Israel. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. So if you think about it, like Ahab has somebody over his house taking care of things. And look at this. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And I just think it's interesting that throughout the Bible, we see examples of men that are living godly, openly, publicly, have a fear of the Lord. So in our day and age, it's like openly, publicly being a Christian. And yet they're excelling in the world, right? So there's no reason why us as godly Christians cannot excel at work, excel in business, do right while still maintaining honesty, integrity, and doing the right thing. And really, you know, even the world values that. They, they value an employee that's honest, that's reliable, right, that you can rely on, you know. And, and look at what Obadiah can do, because Obadiah is a godly man. He fears God. He's over the house of Ahab. He's able to have a positive impact, even in this wicked, wicked time in the kingdom of Israel. For it was so when Jezebel, if you remember, this was the wife of Ahab, 
cut off the prophets of the Lord, right? So Jezebel now, she's so wicked, she's trying to kill off all the prophets of uh, the Lord Jehovah. That Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by 50 in a cave. So he's hiding these people away to try and save them, right? And fed them with bread and water, right? So, uh, you know, I don't know the politics of how kingdoms work and all that sort of stuff, but obviously Ahab, you know, he's a king. You know, he's probably got a lot of that stuff going on. He's not really managing all his affairs. He's got Obadiah taking care of his house. He's got Jezebel causing havoc. And Obadiah is actually trying to save people from Jezebel, right? Hiding people in this cave. And yet, you know, he still has a good relationship with Ahab, right? Because here it says, Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land and unto all fountains of water, unto all brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So that was the one point I wanted to make is that Obadiah is a godly man. And it's kind of like Joseph. You know, Joseph, you think of Joseph, Daniel, these are people, they, they took a stand for the Lord. They weren't worried about what men could do unto them. And yet God can still raise them up and bring them down and still allow you to, to have an impact in this ungodly society. So what happens now in verse 5? So they have, you know, he says to go Obadiah, because there's a famine, he says, hey, you got to go out and search in the land and at least find some grass so we can keep our animals alive, right? And we lose not all the beasts because there's this sore famine that's happening in Samaria. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. So if you imagine the land of Israel, they split it in two and it says, Obadiah, you're going to go that way and Ahab's going to go that way, right? To, to see if there's grass that they can find for their beasts. Now, this is when Obadiah runs into Elijah. So remember, Elijah, three years before, has said there's not going to be any rain for three years until at my word, and, and nobody's been able to find him. Now they're looking for grass. They've divided the king, kingdom between themselves, and they're going throughout the kingdom, and Obadiah runs into Elijah. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, right? So he reckoned, because Obadiah knows, he recognizes Elijah fell on his face and said, Art thou my Lord, Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. So Elijah says to Obadiah, Go and tell King Ahab that I'm here. Um, verse 9, And he said, so this is Obadiah now, he says, What have I sinned, that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me. Why is that? Well, we read on, we'll see why. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord, so he's saying whither King Ahab, hath not sent to seek thee. And when they, and when they said he is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. Right? So Ahab, these last three, he's been looking for Elijah. Right, because Elijah said to him, "It's not going to be rain until I say," and he's realizing it's coming to pass. Right, so he's trying to look for Elijah now, sending people all over the place, and he says to the people that couldn't find Elijah to make an oath. Right, they're basically saying, "Well, I swear by my life, I didn't find him." Right, so he said he made these people take an oath of the kingdom and nation that they that they didn't find Elijah. And now, this is what Obadiah is saying. He says, and now to Elijah, you say, go tell King Ahab, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee, so as soon as like we are no longer talking and I go back to tell Ahab, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I thy servant fear the Lord from my youth. So you understand what he's saying? He's saying, I just met Elijah. Elijah's saying, hey, go tell King Ahab that I'm going to come see him. And he's like, what are, you, what are you doing to me? We've been trying to look for you for the last three years. Nobody's been able to find you. And, and, and they've sworn on their life. And I'm worried that if you go tell me to go tell King Ahab that you're here, that once I leave you, the Spirit of the Lord's going to take you somewhere and Ahab's going to come find you. And that's going to put my life in jeopardy. Was it not told? So he's saying, like, why would you do this to me? Wasn't it told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? So this is when he's trying to plead for his life. So he's saying, don't make me do this, right? I, I fear the Lord. I did this for God. How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And now thou sayest, go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he shall slay me. 
So now Elijah sort of calms him to say, hey, Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So he sort of calms Obadiah and says, don't worry, you know, you go and tell Ahab that I'm here and I, I will do, as I said, I will show, he will, he will find me. I won't be carried away by the spirit of the Lord and put your life in jeopardy. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him and Ahab went to meet Elijah, right? So this is when now we're at the, when he actually challenges King Ahab and the prophets of Baal and uh, the prophets of the grove to the encounter on Mount Carmel, starts in verse 17. And it came to pass, so now Obadiah has told Ahab, hey, Elijah's here, Ahab's come to find Elijah. And he says, when Ahab saw Elijah, that, Eli that Ahab said unto him, look at what Ahab says to Elijah, art thou he that troubleth Israel? And this is how people think of righteous people, right? People that are trying to keep the laws of God. They think we're the troublemakers. We're the ones causing trouble just because we're, you know, that's how it's always painted. Like, that's why, you know, when you say homosexuality is wrong, fornication's wrong, all these doctrines are wrong, you know, they preach, we're always the bad guys, but they're the ones that are actually troubling Christianity. They're teaching the wrong things. Like today, right, this girl that we, where we preach the gospel to grew up in church, wasn't even saved. Right? And when we say, hey, you're preaching the wrong gospel, we're the ones causing it. We're the ones causing division. It's kind of like this with Elijah. Right? Elijah has spoken the word of the Lord, and now he's, he's the one causing trouble. Right? He says, art thou he that troubleth Israel? He says, Are you, you're the one that's causing all this famine, that's causing all this trouble. Look at what Elijah says. He answered, I have not troubled Israel. But thou and thy father's house, right? Talking about Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, right? Because remember, he followed in the, in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. In that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam, right? So there, it's actually the ungodly ones that are causing trouble. It's like in our nation. Why is there trouble now? There's trouble in our nation now, not because of Christians. No, Christians are the reason why it's not getting worse. Right? It's, the, it's the unbelievers that are forsaking the commandments of the God that are causing all the trouble in our nation, all the, the loss of liberty, the lack of personal responsibility, and, and just the, the mess we find ourselves in um, today. 1 Kings 18, verse 19. Now therefore, so this is the challenge, right? Send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. So this is the encounter on Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the grove, 400. So how many is that? 850, right? So it wasn't just the prophets of Baal. I know it's known as Elijah and the prophets of Baal. I even wrote the title with that, but there's others up there too, right? There's the prophets of Baal and there's the prophets of the grove, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. So Ahab accepts the challenge gathers all the false prophets of the kingdom up to Mount Carmel for this face-off on Mount Carmel. And everyone is there too. So everyone is, this is a public encounter here. Everyone is viewing this. All the people of Israel are there too. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, look at this, this is a great uh, sentence here. You know, How long halt ye between, between two opinions? So what is he saying there? Choose a side, right? How long are you going to decide? Like, are you going to serve? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word, right? So he's saying, he's saying this challenge. And this is ought to be a challenge for us too. It's like, when are we going to take, take that decision to serve God? And this is not the first time this challenge is put to people, right? We see this challenge in Exodus 32 when Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side, right? Who is on the Lord's side? Choose the side you're going to take. Are you going to serve the world? Are you going to serve yourself? Are you going to serve the Lord? Just decide and take a side. Don't be half in and half out. Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Look at what Joshua says here in Joshua 24. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Right? Don't put it off. Just decide now. Are you going to serve God 
Or are you going to serve the world? Are you going to serve the God of this world, Satan? Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land, in whose land ye dwell. Look at this. Hopefully you make this decision, right? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, why do you have to choose a side? You say, like, well, I can just be neutral. No, there's no, there's no neutral position in Christianity. I don't know if you know this. There's no such thing as neutral. If you're not gathering with Jesus Christ, you're scattering. This is what Jesus said. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. That's why it's so important as Christians that we need to get in the fight. We need to serve the Lord proactively because there is no neutral position. I always like to liken it like a garden. You have, you have trees in the garden that don't have fruit. We're like trees in the garden of God, right? And if we don't have fruit, that tree is not in a neutral position because that tree takes up nourishment. It takes up space, takes up shade. It has an effect on the ecosystem of that garden, right? So we all want to be fruitful trees. We don't want to sit neutral. We need to realize that if we're not gathering with Jesus Christ, then we are helping the cause of scattering. Right? So that's why it's so important that we don't, like Elijah says, we don't halt, right? we don't stop to, to decide who we're going to serve. We need to make that decision of who we're going to serve and follow through with it. How long halt ye between two opinions? So how much longer are you going to take to make that decision to serve God? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Let's continue here in our verse 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. Now that's not entirely true because there, you know, God tells him later there's 7,000 people that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And even when you read through the story of Ahab, there are other prophets, right? Even the ones that Obadiah hid. But I think there's just, sometimes we as Christians, we think we're alone, but we're never, we're never alone. Uh, even though sometimes we have to go through things alone, there are always there's always a faithful remnant. There's always people that believe and want to serve God, even though we're in the minority. So he says, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. So what happens here? So now he challenges them. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods and i will call on the name of the lord and the god that answereth answereth by fire let him be god and all the people answered and said it is well spoken so what's the challenge if you remember on mount carmel basically he's saying hey you guys you're going to choose out a bullock and i'm going to choose out a bullock Right? And you're going to cut that bullock in pieces and you're going to sacrifice it to your God and I'm going to cut my bullock in pieces and sacrifice it to the Lord God. And he says the God that answers by fire, right, one that consumes it by fire, is going to be God and this is going to be publicly known. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods but put no fire under, right? So this is, they're, they're preparing the sacrifice, but they're not lighting it on fire, right? They're not burning the sacrifice. It's going to be their God that's going to answer by fire. This is an amazing thing that happens. I mean, it'd be great if, if you could see it, you know, <laughs> see, see this event unfold. Uh, 1 Kings 18, 26, And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered. No, no shock, right? Because it's a false god, right? <clears throat> and they leaped upon the altar which was made. So it's quite a spectacle that's going on if you think about it. They're there all day, right? So you might watch a video and it's sort of going really quickly, but if you were there actually experiencing, they called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon. So they're doing this for hours calling out to Baal and they're getting no response they're getting on the altar that they built they're jumping on it right so they leaped upon the altar which was made and look at this and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them 
right? That's why this is where people sort of get that example to mock false religions, right? Some of this, the stupidity of the things they do. So I like those videos that they put up on YouTube sometimes of people carrying their statues and they fall over and they make a mockery of it because it's silly. It's so silly that they do this and they are worshipping something that they made themselves. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, look at what he says, cry aloud. So crying in the Bible doesn't necessarily mean weeping, right? In the, in the, in the King James Bible, when you, when you actually cry, like we say, you'd weep and you're weeping, you wept. So crying is when you shout, right? Cry aloud. So he's, saying, he's saying, hey, maybe you need to cry. Maybe you need to shout louder, right? But he is a God, lowercase g, right? False God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he's, he's, he's trying to find something. Or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. What he's saying, he's saying your God is maybe like a human being. Like sometimes, you know, when I'm, we're talking and Simon's trying to get my attention, right? He has to cry a bit louder. He's, this is how he's mocking them. He's like saying, because your God is not a true God. Maybe he's busy, right? Maybe because maybe he can't, can't listen to you and listen to other people at the same time. So you've got to cry louder, right? Cry louder. He's a God. Maybe he's talking. Maybe he's trying to find something. You know, he's in a journey. Or he's sleeping. Maybe your God's asleep. You need to wake him up. And they cried aloud. Look at this. Now they're getting desperate, right? They cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. So they're even to the point where they're cutting themselves and having their own blood on the altar, crying out that this false God would answer them. And it came to pass when midday was past. And they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. So now they've gone from morning till noon, and now noon all the way till the evening, right? That there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. So now it's Elijah's turn. Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. Now it's interesting what, what and this was pointed out to me. It's kind of like, you know, because maybe in the Old Testament there's a lot of trickery going on, a lot of different sorcery. So he's saying, hey, now that he's going to, you know, prove that the Lord God of Israel is, is Jehovah, right? He's saying, hey, well, come near as he prepares for this sacrifice, right? He's not hiding anything. There's nothing. So it's kind of like when they do that with magic, right? They're sort of like, you know, and I know there's all that trickery that goes on too, but, you know, you just like, they get people to stand around them. They want to sort of give that, that idea that they're not hiding anything and they, people can inspect what's going on. And all the people came near unto him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. So he takes, he builds this altar. And if you remember when you build an altar to the Lord, you don't put your tool on it, right? So you don't fashion like one out of brick or anything. You just take these unhewn stones. So they're just loose stones that you take. So he's taking 12 and he's making this altar. And that each of those uh, stones represent one of the tribes of Israel, which is the, you know, what Jacob is. Unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. So that's when he was renamed Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Now, I, I don't know exactly how many two measures of seed is, but I think it's a lot of seed, right? Because he's making this altar, and he's built a trench around this altar. So if you, if you can see that picture in your head. So a trench is like a moat. Right, so this moat around the altar. <clears throat> and he put the wood in order. So now he's got the wood on the altar. He cut the bullock in pieces. So now he's prepared the bullock, laid him on the wood. And look at this. And said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Now, four barrels of water is already a lot of water, right? Four barrels of water. They're going to pour. So if you think about it, he's, he's prepared. So when you want to start a fire, what do you not do? You don't get it wet, right? You need to have it dry. I mean, water is going to put out the fire. You know, if you have, it's, that's why when you try and start a fire at camp, you can't get like just fresh branches and stuff because there's too much water in them. It's harder to start that fire. Well, not only is he putting this wood and the bullock on there, now he's drenching it with water, right? And the trench is there to, so that it catches all the water, right? Because otherwise it would just all spill out. So the, the trench is getting filled with water too. So not only that, he gets four barrels with water, he drenches this this sacrifice that he's about to show, to show that nobody can light this on fire, right? He said, do it the second time. So how many barrels is that now? That's eight barrels of water they're pouring on the sacrifice. 
And they did it the second time, and look at this, and he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. So how many barrels of water now? 12. That might be interesting. Maybe each barrel of water represented the 12 tribes of Israel too. I don't know. And I just, and I just thought of that now, actually, when I was counting. So and they did it the third time. 12 barrels of water poured. Now the trench is all filled up with water. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. So if you imagine this site, the, this sacrifice is ready, saying, hey, God is going to answer by fire to prove that it's God. He, he basically drenches the whole thing with water, right? 12 barrels. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant. So this is, this is such a great example for us that he's about to accomplish something great and he, and he acknowledges that he is serving God. He's a servant of God. He's giving God the glory. And look at this. And I have done all these things at thy word. So I think it's interesting that phrase there because it makes me believe that God actually gave him this instruction. It wasn't just... A, you know, I don't think it was necessary just Elijah just coming up with his own plan. You know, I think God actually told him, hey, this is what you're going to do. You're going to ask, go, get them to come up to Mount Carmel. You're going to make this altar. You're going to do this. You're going to fill it with water. And then he's going to... So I think God actually told him what was going to happen. And I think he's acknowledging here that this is not what he had come up with, but this is what he was told to do. I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. So this is, so I think this is a great thing because, you know, even as preachers, I think we often got to, often going to, uh, got to uh, realize that we just preach God's word. We just do what God has told us to do and God works in the lives of people and his word speaks to them. And that thou hast turned, thou hast turned their heart back again. So this is when God answers. This is when the miracle happens, right? And then the fire of the Lord fell. Can you imagine this sight? That he's preparing this altar. Everyone's standing around. He's just drenched it. He calls out to the Lord God and says, I'm thy servant. I've done all these things at thy word. And fire just literally falls from heaven and consumes this burnt sacrifice. And the wood. So this is just no small fire, right? This fire comes down from heaven it consumes the sacrifice the wood the stones and the dust and look at this and licked up the water that was in the trench so the fire was so intense that even the water that was filling that trench remember the 12 barrels of water it all evaporates it's all gone and when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the lord he is the god the lord he is the god and Elijah said unto them, and I think this is interesting because when you read before, if you've heard about the prophets of Baal and Elijah, generally that's where the story stops, right? The story stops where the fire comes down and there's a great victory and everyone's like, oh, the Lord, he is the God. But that's not where the story ends, right? Verse 40, Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape, and they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kydron, Kaishon, and slew them there. Do you remember how many prophets there were? 850? So this was a slaughter, right? He's saying, hey, don't let them escape. So he's not just, oh, you know, Lord's God, hey, you guys keep continuing to do your thing, and we're just going to serve. No, he says, get them, and we're going to kill them. Amen. And a lot of people think, hey, this is a harsh thing. But no, no, but people don't realize how serious of a crime it is to preach another God. Right? And in the Old Testament, I'm not going to read through all first, uh, first uh, Deuteronomy 13, but this is why I, I don't believe in freedom of religion. You know, I know that's not politically correct, but I don't believe in freedom of religion. You can't have a righteous society with freedom of religion. How can you have a righteous society when people are allowed to worship Satan? Yep. And that's why you happen now. Every, everything's done under the banner of religion, right? Yep. It's just like, oh, this is me expressing my religion. I'm just going to you know, worship Baal. And you can't have a righteous society with freedom of religion. Freedom of religion is a libertarian philosophy. And whilst I swing towards libertarianism, I am not libertarian because I'm a, I'm a bibliotarian, right? I'm a bibliotarian. That's, that's, how, that's, that's where I get my political philosophy. So 
freedom of religion, even freedom of speech has its limits in the Bible, right? So you don't want to be too swayed in that direction to say, oh, you can just say whatever you want. No, there are some things you can't say and there are some things you can't do. And preaching a false religion is one of them in a godly society, right? Because, you know, whether we get a law like this passed in Australia will never happen, you know. I, I doubt it'll ever happen where you get laws that, you know, punish adultery by capital punishment, punish homosexuality by capital punishment, punish false religions by capital punishment. I mean, that's just not going to happen. But it's important that people know what God expects and how God deals with these things to know the seriousness of these things. And Elijah understood that. That's why in 1 Kings 18, they killed all the prophets, right? Because they're preaching another God. Look what it says here. It says here, a pro I'm just going to skim through this, but I just want to show you the three examples in Deuteronomy 13. It says here, a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, right? If he says to you, let us go after other gods. He says, don't hearken unto the words of that prophet in verse 3, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. Why? Because following a false religion ultimately leads people to hell as well. So not only that, he says, and that prophet and that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So does this sound like to you that God had a system of govern government where any religion goes? No, he says if there's a false prophet or a dreamer of dreams that says, hey, worship another God, he says you kill that false prophet or dreamer of dreams. And to show you how serious it is to preach a false God, a false religion, he says even here, look at this, even your brother, can, we, can you imagine this? This, this goes, is so counter to what we would accept, right? Because we don't understand the seriousness of false religions, even in a spiritual realm, right? So that's why the most a church can do is cast people out. That's why in the New Testament, we have heretics cast out of the church. People that preach a false religion or a false God. Look at here, he says, your brother, the son of your own mother, or your son or your daughter, See, you think about these, these are the people that you hold dear to you, right? The wife of thy bosom, even your wife, your friend, when we talked about friendship last week, which is as thine own soul, right? If they entice thee secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou and all thy fathers, namely of the gods, so we'll just skip down for sake of time. Look at this, he says, thou shalt surely kill him, thine hand shall be burst upon him to put him to death. Right, see, this is, a bit, you know, this is a bit shock value for us when we read passages like this because we live in an ungodly, wicked society where any religion goes, right? But in a righteous society, no, not every religion goes. You have to worship the true God. And if you're telling people to worship another God, you're getting them to worship a false God and, and all the things that come with it, right? So that's why this is so serious that God says, hey, even if somebody that close to you says that, you don't. And even here, he says, hey, even in one of the cities which the Lord thy God had given thee to dwell there. So they were given a certain nation from God. And he's saying, hey, not even any nation that lives in the land that God gave you. If they, if you hear about them saying, let us go and serve other gods. He says, hey, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword. So was this, I think this is a little different to like what Islam does because, uh, you know, this is where we have to be careful when we condemn Islam too much because you know, people say, oh, you condemn Islam because they say, you know, go kill this and do that. And the Bible says the same stuff, right? There's some similar things. Like the Bible has death penalty too. The Bible has you can't just worship any God. But what's the difference? I think the difference is Islam goes to conquer other nations, right? They're trying to, to build up an empire. It's not that God has given them that land to rule and saying, hey, you, you have dominion over this land. So this is man taking the dominion of land, I believe, into his own hands, as opposed to land being given by God. And you see all throughout the Bible, even, even not with the nation of Israel and the nation of Judah, but even other kingdoms, you know, God has his hand in those kingdoms, you know? So it seems that there was a time where God is like setting up these kingdoms. And, you know, we live in a time where, you know, you know the, the kingdom of God is now a spiritual kingdom, so we're not out to try and conquer lands, 
right? Our kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It's different now. And that's why, you know, the, the, the world is just doing what the world does. They war and they do what they do, but, you know, we don't have to do that. That's why, you know, whether we can influence a society to ever pass laws to get to this point, you know, is, is probably very difficult. But, you know, we are not to, like the Muslims who actually by force set up a law like that, because that's the difference. Because the Muslims actually believe, no, by force, you know, they should set up Sharia and, and try and conquer lands and get people to do that, as opposed to a land that God had given these people. And he's saying, hey, I've given you this land and this is how I want it governed. And that's why he's saying, if you hear somebody in the land that is trying to draw people away from the true God, then you cleanse your land that I've given you of this false religion. And that's why these laws were given. Uh, we'll just skip over that for sake of time. So that was just, that's Deuteronomy 13. So you can go and read Deuteronomy 13 yourself. That was the laws given to people preaching a false God. So just to finish up this story, just so we can finish off 1 Kings 18. So after he killed all the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove, grove, Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to, to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. So he's praying to God now, right? And said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. So, so, so what's happening? He's telling Ahab to go back home. Elijah goes up to Mount Carmel. He's praying to God, says to his servant to look out to the seas to see if there's any movement. He says, I don't see anything. He said, go again seven times. So again, so he's praying, he's going nothing the seventh time. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Isn't that interesting? So he looks out, it's like a man's hand coming out of the sea. Um, and he said, go up, say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. Right? So he's saying, you better get home, otherwise the rain is going to prevent you from getting there. And it came to pass in the meanwhile. So, see the, so, the, so the miracle doesn't happen here, right? Because the miracle doesn't stop at that fire coming down. But remember, the, the end of the, the, uh, the miracle was, he's saying, hey, when I say, the rain's going to come. So now he says, the, there's going to be rain. And then that same day, rain comes. That the heaven was black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain. So it didn't just rain a little bit, right? It wasn't just sprinkling. It's like, all of a sudden, like Sydney weather. <laughs> all of a sudden, black clouds come. Did you, were you guys, did you guys get the rain in the last couple of days? It was just like sunny, and then all of a sudden it's just black, and it's like, <laughs> it's like this. Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Anyways, I hope that was interesting for you as we went through that story and you learned something new from that story that you didn't see before. But, you know, just to encourage you, you know, you've got to read these stories in the Old Testament. There's like so much information in them. And sometimes it's great to hear preaching like this because they come alive to you. But when you're familiar with these stories, man, you, you can really see what's going on and they're really interesting. So what's the application to Elijah? You know, it's interesting that we, we learn about Elijah. We see this miracle, this great victory that happened. Um, you know, encourages us to stand for the Lord. And I think that's what we can learn from Elijah and the prophets of Baal is, you know, when you stand for what's right, when you stand for the truth, when you stand with Jesus Christ, often you'll be in the minority, right? But you need to know that even though, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't expect your faith to be like a popular opinion, but you know that when you stand on the side of truth, when you stand for what's right, you are standing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? So even though you may stand alone with men, like Elijah did, he stood alone right, against 850 prophets of Baal. But who was on his side? The Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So always remember that. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this, this story that we read about. Oh, Lord, help us to have the boldness of the prophet Elijah and to stand for what's right, even though we may stand alone in the eyes of the world. But Lord, help us to have the faith that we know that we stand with you and that that would give us the boldness, Lord, to excel um, you know, in this world in terms of taking a stand. Help us not to shy away from who we are, that we're ambassadors for you. Uh, Lord, even though we take that stand, we can see Obadiah's example, that you can still do well 
in the world and have a positive influence, Lord, and rise up to places of power and prevent a lot of wickedness from wicked people. So I pray, Lord, that we would take this story to heart. And thank you, Lord, for, for giving us such detail into these encounters. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.